We're now going to move to our next speaker, who is Kate Barker. Kate Barker is the CEO of LGB Alliance and is going to give us a broad overview of um, what's happening with LGB Alliance and what activities, uh, etc. So thank you so much for coming, Kate. Oh, no, thank you. you. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be here. Hello, everybody. Um, Yes. So um, in in putting this together, I, I put in together some notes. I was having a think about the title for this and I came up with um, sticks and stones and I was reflecting on the notion that we've been lucky enough at LGB Alliance never to have been attacked. We've been threatened by protesters before um, and and lucky enough not to have been punched in the face by misogynists, as I know other women have when they've been peacefully um, protecting the erasure of their of their rights. However, we have been called a lot of names and we continue to be called names so I had a look on um, Twitter this morning and just just for a little selection um, for your interest of the kind of things that we're that we're called and I found um, just in a short search uh, we're a hate group we're Nazis racists anti-abortionists the religious right uh, guff monkeys which was which was an odd one a tiny little ball of hate and spite I also, we're always the so-called LGB alliance, which I find very difficult to understand because even if they really hate us, that is our literal name. But we get that all the time anyway, the so-called LGB alliance. And then there's fascists, scum, murderers, um, turfs. I'm, I'm fine with that one. Um, but the worst and the most outrageous thing they say about us consistently um, is that they say we're straight, which, of course, um, we're not. Now, the name calling, I know that's probably common for all of us when we're, you know, open about our open about our position. And it doesn't hurt us personally anymore within the organisation, although it is, it is really wearing. And when it becomes personal, it, it's, it become, can be difficult to handle. Um, but what it does do is it hurts our reputation as an organisation. So we're a registered charity um, and we've had grants withdrawn that we've already been awarded following an out, a big outcry on social media. We've had, we find it very difficult to book venues. And sometimes when we do book venues, they'll get wind of the fact that we're going to be there. Um, and then that venue will be closed to us within just a few hours. Politicians that we would like to be talking to are the ones who are least likely to want to talk to us because of our reputation. But I, also really very many people who are sympathetic to us and, um, are afraid to say so publicly. And I think that really says something um, frightening about the state of our of our broader society, that even to express an opinion that you think LGB Alliance might have a point on some things um, is absolutely forbidden and people feel they'll be cancelled or attacked for doing so. So it's a really scary state of affairs. And, and most significantly, that name calling essentially is what led to our court case Mermaids took us to court basically because they said we were a hate group and that we shouldn't therefore have charitable status. Um, That court case took two years. It cost us a quarter of a million pounds. It sucked up an enormous amount of time and effort. You know, and that money could have been spent on some of the work that we actually want to do. And it was a huge personal strain, particularly uh, for the for the people who were actually had to be witnesses and, and our founders. It was just you know, it was absolutely terrible. Now we won, so that's that's fantastic. Um, but I would say that all of this name calling, and I think that's something that we're all subject to, not not just LGB Alliance. Um, however loud it is, and ha- however vicious it is, in some ways it's a bit of a distraction. Um, and I think there's something much more dangerous and pernicious going on under the surface, a little bit more quietly. And that's the coercion of our of our language so that we are the, the coercive appropriation of our language. So we, we are not even allowed to have the words to describe ourselves, to describe our, our unique experience of being in the world. Um, and if we if we can't describe ourselves and our experiences, you also can't effectively delineate the discrimination that you might be um, that you might be facing. So it's a really peculiar and effective way to silence women, which is just not not necessarily to tell them to shut up, but just to repurpose the words so that they no longer have the meaning that you need them to have. 
And that's just that's just going on everywhere. Um, so I want to talk to you about how that relates to uh, the latest campaign that we've worked on. But I'll sort of take a step backwards first for people that don't don't know anything about us. So um, LGB Alliance was formed in 2019 by two absolutely amazing, brilliant women, both lesbians, um, lifelong campaigners for gay rights. And that's Bev Jackson and Kate Harris. Um, our, our, I'm the CEO and I'm clearly a woman. Our chair is a woman. Most of our staff, most of our volunteers are women. And we're really keenly aware that there's the dual discrimination that we face as lesbians and as women, which is why a lot of the work that we do is very much focused on lesbians rather than gay men. It's not just the fact that there's more women who work for us than there are men, but I think it's women who are disproportionately um, feeling the uh, feeling crushed by what's happening at the moment. Um, now, um, all of the cases that, so, so what, I'll tell you what we actually do. So um, we're not a membership organisation, but our support, the background to us, our supporters are around, we've, we've done some supporter surveys, around 34% of us are lesbians, 33% are gay men, about 20% are straight people, and we're very happy with them as allies, and 12% are people are bisexuals. We are very often uh, accused of being a right-wing organisation or we're funded by some shady right-wing opaque groups but actually our politics even though we're not a partisan group are broadly left so we ask people where do you see yourself in political terms as well um, and the survey showed that 57 uh, percent of our supporters described themselves as being their politics as being left or center left 16 um, percent as centrist and 21 percent as right or center right it's actually quite telling that when you broke that down, the, the people who said they were right or centre right were nearly all of our male supporters. So as a, as a group, we do fit the age old stereotype of the lefty lesbian. And that's fine. And we're all quite we're all quite happy with that. We might not be portrayed as that um, in the in the wider world, but that, that's the way it is. So what we actually do is we scrutinise legislation. Um, and we highlight where we think it might discriminate against LGB people. We try as hard as we can to make friends with politicians in order that we're going to be able to influence policy making um, and make it in favour of LGB people. We campaign for free speech and discourse on on all issues. Now that's that stands in really stark contrast contrast to the no debate. Uh, mantra that's come from Stonewall and I think is um, pretty much responsible for the for the trouble that we find ourselves in now that it's not just that that we are not allowed to debate the issues but at the same time they've been dismantling the words for us to be able to do so even if we are brave enough to stand up and say this is not right so you've got those dual things happening at the same time um, we run lots of campaigns as well, and we've run campaigns which have been successful against the medicalization of gender non-conforming children. Um, and that would, if we're talking about girls, we're basically talking about tomboys, tomboys who are on the pathway to gender clinics, um, who, who are overwhelmingly girls, the young people that go to gender clinics, and they overwhelmingly state that they are attracted to people of the same sex. So what we're seeing is the medicalization with puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, and then moving along the pathway to um, possibly even surgery. You, what you've got is a cohort of young girls who, if left alone, would grow up to be happily lesbian. And it's an absolute, it's the biggest medical scandal of the century, in, in my view. And as it starts to unravel, and as this cohort of girls becomes dissatisfied with what they saw as a quick fix for their own unhappiness with their bodies. Um, I, I, I think it's we're going to see an absolute tragedy unfold. And people who've said nothing um, and let this happen will really have to search their souls about why they stayed silent. So that's a really, really key issue for us. And that issue is how we I got involved with LGB Alliance. Kate Harris was telling me about um, puberty blockers. Um, we, we met at some event. And my, my background is running a creative agency. So I put together 
a marketing piece for them, a little film, which I'm still really proud of. And it said, um, it said, some people think girls who like football need puberty blockers and a bilater- bilateral mastectomy. And we think they need football boots. And that's really essentially the nub of our position on the medicalization of adolescence. It's let children be gender nonconforming and give them the time and space to work it out for themselves. Um, we also run a national conference and it's just coming up. It's on the 27th of October at the QE2 Centre in London. Get your tickets. It's brilliant. It's a really good day. Um, a good lunch and there's a disco at the end. Um, but it does get more importantly, it covers all the really pressing issues um, and it gets it gets LGB people together. And that's something that we as a community, none of us really like that word, but you know what I mean, that we so rarely have these days. It's really, really rare to get a big gathering of people who are all lesbians or all gay men or all LGB people together because our groups have not been permitted to to gather. So our conference is a really good opportunity to get up to a thousand people together in a room, really just celebrating what it means to be lesbian or gay or bisexual, because it's not all doom and gloom and it used to be fun and we think it can be fun again. And that's part of our remit as well, providing role models for young people to show that you, know, you can be you can be a, a proud lesbian or or gay man, gay man, and that there's no need to mutilate your body in order to conform to somebody else's stereotype, regressive stereotype of who you should be. Um, so we also spend time trying to raise money. We, all, all our funding is from individual donations and not, as people speculate, through the Heritage Foundation or all kinds of uh, evangelical churches in America or something like that. You know, it's all through individual donations. So it's a constant struggle to try and um, generate funds for us to just to be able to exist and to, and to be able to continue putting on events and running campaigns. So lots of the work we do is is not campaigns and it's a bit behind the scenes so I'll give you just a couple of examples of things that we've done recently that are very typical so we helped um, a woman approached us who works in a big national institution um, in and she is a senior person and she runs the LGB group in that institution and for years and years it's been very successful and she's had 300 people come along And as well as the LGB group, there's a trans group, trans staff group, and a non-binary staff group. And both those two groups only allow trans people or only allow non-binary people entry into them. Now, the LGB group um, was approached by a trans-identifying male, a cross-dressing man, who said he was a lesbian and he would like to join. Um, and this is about the, the taking our language and it's being very difficult to counter. So this, this man said he was a lesbian and wanted to join the group. So the person we're helping let him come into the group. He was very aggressive. He began berating everybody else that turned up for their meetings, which is more or less generally just social events, uh, telling them that they were transphobic because they were same sex attracted rather than same gender attracted. So he was sore, basically, that the lesbians were not attracted to him because he identified a lesbian. He said he was a lesbian. Therefore, the lesbians who weren't attracted to him, that was their fault. That was their problem. They they should educate themselves. They were transphobic. So this continued in the group um, until uh, the person we're helping said recently she sent out a notification to people to join the usual subcommittees that she runs. Um, she said usually, you know, 40 or 50 people reply and volunteer, put their hand up to be on the committee. This time, 13 people replied, and every single one of them was a trans or a non-binary person who've infiltrated the group, even though they have their own group. And the lesbians and the gay men and the bisexuals have fled. They've, they've, they've fled from it. So now they go from having their support group to having no support at all. And of course, that's not the end of it because our person was called into HR and senior management and quizzed about her transphobia because she believes that homosexuality is same sex attraction and that lesbians are not attracted to a man simply because he decides that he feels like a woman. And this is at the heart of of a lot of issues that we deal with. 
other other um, people that we help, we get a lot of letters, a lot of emails from parents who are desperately worried about what's what's happening in schools. We're helping a woman who whose daughter told her that she was a lesbian. Uh, she's about 15 years old. And the girl seemed quite like okay with that. She she talked it through with her mom. She felt that was quite cool. She went into school, didn't get a very positive reaction, became very quiet about it. Um, and what had happened was that the school had referred the girl without either of her parents' knowledge to a trans charity and set her up with in-person meetings with a counsellor. So the school had decided that the girl maybe was trans. Um, and that charity had given her a breast binder. And then that charity had later made her an appointment with a private GP. Uh, they had paid the fee and the girl was taking hormones. Now, this was when she hit 16. So the girl was, was taking cross-sex hormones. And then one evening, the family, there was a knock at the door and it was a social worker from Brighton and Hove Council. Anyone who's in the UK won't be surprised to hear that it's Brighton and Hove. And it was Brighton and Hove Council. And the social worker came in and announced that, right, you've got a son now and not a daughter. If there's, if you don't accommodate this, if you don't change your attitudes, which I'm a real telling off, your child will be taken away. And that evening, um, the woman's husband, the father, um, attempted suicide um, about it. And now the, the, the child has, has been removed the family the family is entirely broken down um and we hear that we get a lot of letters not many as extreme as that but a lot of letters from parents whose lesbian daughters have been told by outsiders that being a lesbian isn't appropriate and if they if they've got short hair or if they're sporty or if they're attracted to girls these are all signs that they are really born in the wrong body and that they should be that they should be boys so that, that's a main that's that's a significant part of what we do, which is is helping individuals who who approach us. And all the cases are very different, but they do all seem to have this common denominator. And that is again returning to this idea that women we are unable to protect our our rights or to define the discrimination that we face because our language has been kind of malappropriated and then mangled and flipped and then thrown thrown back at us so um our most recent project so the last one i'll tell you about is and people again in the uk may have seen this in the news and we're really really pleased with the way with the way this went but it's a very typical problem and i think we're going to see more of it so we were approached by um a very lovely uh woman called jenny watson and she's a town planner at camden council the workiest of the work um, and she's been running lesbian social events, including lesbian speed dating events for about five years in the centre of London in, in, in a couple of different venues. So she was happily having one of her speed dating events in a pub off Tottenham Court Road. And a guy turned up and he was wearing head to toe purple latex, obviously all skin tight, all the better to display his erection. Um, now, I've never been to lesbian speed dating, but and I think mo most of us can agree that the last thing that's going to improve it is that, you know, or any man, whether or not he's in latex and got an erection. Um, and Jenny said, you know, she feels ashamed of herself, but she didn't say anything because she was too afraid of him. He said he, he announced that he was a lesbian. She was she, she didn't know how to respond. She was She was afraid of his reaction if she said he wasn't. And then a few months later, another guy came and he was brushing up against women in the in the queue at the toilets and making people feel uncomfortable. They complained to her. And, and this time she said, I, I could not stay silent. Really big guy. She said, I was shaking. My voice was shaking. But I had to say to him, you, this is, a, this is a, an event for lesbians. Lesbians are women. You're not welcome. You need to go. So... On her website, it clearly said this is a lesbian speed dating event, but clearly that's not enough because the word lesbian now can include a male. So she went back onto her website and she changed the wording. So it said, um, this is a woman-only event for lesbians. 
do not come if you're a man. You are not a lesbian. Now, this enraged the trans-identifying men who began to wage a huge campaign and a vendetta against her. Um, and it was led by a, a person called Emily, who's about six foot two and looks like a scaffolder, um, who wrote to say that he was a lesbian with the, and he would very much like to come along to speed dating. Um, and, uh, and, and Jenny said, said no. So he began to organise with other activists and they wrote to Camden Council where she works and said, this person is a hateful transphobe and she must be sacked. And it triggered an investigation into her, which was hugely stressful. They contacted the platform where she sells her tickets um, and attempted to shut that down. They sent her some very unsettling emails, things like this is not going to go away. Um, and it, one day she opened her post and there was a gang rape threat in her post, in her own home, on her doormat. It's terrifying. And then, of course, they pressured the pub where she was having the event and persuaded them to close it. And that and that's where we, the point at which we began to help. So I went with her and I went to see the manager of the pub and I went to see the area manager to try and understand their decision and to help. The pub manager was extremely smug and very pleased with himself. And he said to us, no, no, this event must be cancelled because it is not inclusive. And, and when pressed on, well, what do you mean inclusive? In inclusive of whom? Well, it must include it must include men, or it does not align with the values of the pub. He told us that complaints have been received by men who were lesbians. And this is where you go down a sort of a rabbit hole of what does this all mean? Men who were lesbians who said it was unfair they were not welcome to attend. Now, it's clear that in the wider world, most people would think it absolutely absurd that the desire of a trans-identifying man to go to a lesbian event was considered more important than all of the women who were attending who wanted it to be women only. But the issue once more is with language, and it's it, the issue is with Stonewall, who've been deliberately feeding um, information to businesses about what is and what isn't lawful in an effort to subvert the law to give trans people rights over women which they never previously have and which the law does not offer them. So it's the equality and diversity, <clears throat> excuse me, industry, um, which has, has really got its tentacles into every large organisation, every institution in the country. And the source material for all these presentations comes from Stonewall and it comes from TQ plus lobby groups, groups that are really misogynistic to the core which deliberately rep misrepresent the Equality Act 2010 to suggest that trans people's rights are always preeminent. And what they do is by replacing the biological reality of sex with this sort of very nebulous um, idea of, of gender, um, the result is that people who are same sex attracted find themselves uh, without the words to describe the discrimination, they find themselves at the bottom of the heap. And it, it's an approach that because businesses call in consultants and they, they do these presentations and a lot of businesses genuinely think that a trans identifying male may do whatever he likes whenever he chooses and it is in fact unlawful to stand in his way and that's their, that's their quick takeout that in the sort of hierarchy of, of marginalisation men somehow have managed to make their way to the top and same sex attractive people are at the bottom so we wrote, we're not, we're not litigious um, as an organisation, partly because we're a charity, it doesn't, it's not a good use of funds, which are scarce. But also I think people are finding it, there's a little bit of a weariness about crowdfunding for court cases now, especially that they last a long time, they cost a huge amount of money and there's a cost of living crisis. So, so instead I wrote to the... Um, CEO of the Stonegate Group, which owned this pub. It's the biggest pub group in the country. They own 1,400 venues, lots of lots of big venues. And I said, I pointed out that it was probably dis illegal to discriminate against the lesbian group. And I just asked him a couple of sensible questions, which were, if a lesbian group is forced to allow a man to attend, is it still 
a lesbian group? Some really simple questions like that, really simple common sense questions. And um, I think it was interesting that actually I received a, quite a gracious letter back quite quickly. And it's at times like this that it reminded me that we are winning this fight because there are a lot of people who, outside of our circle, upon hearing the message, they think it's ridiculous that a, a mother is now a birthing parent or that a man can click his fingers and say that he's a woman. People don't believe it. They think it's ridiculous that the, the head of this organisation absolutely got it that a man cannot steal our label and he reinstated Jenny's event. And it was satisfying too. They did something which we didn't ask for, which was to launch an investigation into the manager of that pub because of comments he'd made about turfs and, um, you know, a, a, a few un a unpleasant comments. And we didn't ask for that because we didn't know if we'd get it or not, but it was offered up. And at that, um, that in now, because they're the biggest pub group in, in the country, we're, we've made a, a kind of a case study for that. And we're being approached by other people who are trying to run lesbian events in different venues in different parts of the country. And we've now got an approach that we think works, which is pointing out without sending a legal letter where the it's likely that these people are breaking the law, making some really sensible statements about why lesbians need their own spaces and just exerting a little bit of pressure. And it doesn't hurt either that it comes with the backing of LGB Alliance. And I think some of these organisations will look at They'll look us up and they'll think, oh, those were those crackpots that spent, you know, they were willing to take on mermaids in court, even though we were defending ourselves. Maybe they would launch a court case. So it just gives a little bit of weight to the individual that we're helping, that we're kind of behind and, and able to do something about it. And it's wonderful, but it, it's also been wonderful to see Jenny, how excited she is. She's been, had these events again. Um, she had one last night in a, in a club in Leicester Square, which is also owned by the Stonegate Group, and had 200 women there um, and was able to say on her on her website and on the meetup about this is a women only, this is lesbian. She didn't need to say don't come if you're a man because we've already made that case and, and men won't be admitted. So it does feel like a little step forward. So to, to, to conclude, really, I... Things like lesbian speed dating, by definition, are not are not for everyone. Um, and the notion that all events have to be inclusive do really make a, a sort of nonsense of the specific protections of the Equality Act. So we need to, we, a couple of things we need to do. We need to make it clear that categories are exclusionary. When people pipe up, you know, you're being exclusionary. Well, so what? That's how categories work. And we need to be a bit stronger, a bit stronger on that. Um, you know, they tell you who can come in and who can't. Um, and we need to be able to, to identify and define our categories and fight for them and stand up for them. I think we need to stand very firm on language. To my mind, it was a mistake that we that trans women slipped under the under the radar because it was a slippery slope to them claiming woman. Um, and uh, trans identifying male are coming for female now as well. So we need to make it really, really clear at LGB Alliance that lesbian is, is already taken. And heterosexual, trans-identifying men need to think of their own word uh, and not and not try and purloin ours. Um, we're also calling for businesses and institutions to move away from this uh, entreaty to be kind. Which, if you look at any organisation, you look at their vision and values. It's always they always want to be kind. Stop being kind. It's time to be fair. That's all. You know, fair to everybody. That's all everybody wants. Um, and we're also trying to ensure that that talking about language as, as often as we can so that because it can sometimes see arcane, seem a bit arcane or a bit trivial to some people just fiddling about with language it seems a bit peripheral to the big struggle but I would argue it's right at the heart of it and it's at the it's at the the, the mangling of the languages at the core of this movement which really seeks to disenfranchise women and lesbians so I think we need to keep an eye on it and we need to stand firm on it um, and a renewed focus on the Equality Act in, in Parliament and a clarification that sex means sex is something we're pushing for too. But lastly, I think the most important thing we do and the, the reason we exist um, is, to, is to support individual lesbians and gay men and bisexuals. And we found as a, as a strategy that a really good way to do that is to be able to find a person who embodies the 
the, the problem that we're trying to solve so that people can connect with them, can understand with Jenny, they could understand that um, how awful that this lovely young woman just trying to have a nice night out um, and some crazy guys are, try, are trying to gate crash it. We need, we need people to come forward with their stories so that people can identify with them, feel warm towards them. Um, and in that way, we're helping individuals, but I really, really think we can, and we are, shifting public perception about what it means to be gay and what it means to fight for our, for our rights. You do quite a lot of international work and you have groups internationally. Can you round up how that's going and how many different groups you have? Yeah, so, so when we first started, um, so many people were interested in countries around the world, particularly ones that were really um, suffering under gen, you know, gender ideology, that they got in touch with us. And we were so thrilled and delighted that anyone was even remotely interested in us that we were like, yeah, great. And we sent our logo out left, right and centre. Um, so we've got what we have is actually lots of loosely affiliated groups of friends everywhere from sort of Iceland and Ireland and in the States and, of course, in Canada. Um, and we're at the moment looking at ways that we can slightly formalise those links so we can share information better and we can be kind of an international force without each of those groups losing their autonomy, because clearly every every country has has different issues. And we as a as a kind of a head office don't have the resources or the staff to to be able to manage that. So we're feeling our way at the moment how we can link up so we can talk a bit more on one voice as in one voice about some of the big issues. But yeah, they do some brilliant work. LGB Alliance in Australia is um you know, doing some doing some really fantastic work as are other groups. Um, but we don't we collaborate with them but we don't yeah. oversee them and we collaborate with each other, but we're looking to formalize. Yeah. 